Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mark Beasley, Curatorial Director here at Pace Gallery with Julian Chnabel and James Nares. Julian's first solo exhibition at the gallery's new Chelsea home, The Patch of Blue, The Prisoner Calls the Sky, opened on March the 5th and shortly after closed to the public due to COVID-19. Here we are at Pace's 510 West 25th location with Julian's latest exhibition that opened on September 18th. The Sad Lament of the Brave, Let the Wind Speak and Other Paintings. It builds upon his spring presentation with the gallery and the exhibition is accompanied by a deeply personal exhibition essay from James Nares, who we'll hear from shortly. The show will be on view at Pace Chelsea Gallery from September 18th to October 24th and by appointment via the PACE website. Julian Schnabel's work reminds us that the first, deepest, and most enduring understanding we have of any experience is intuitive. And being intuitive, it is momentary, immediate, comprehensive, uncritical, and true. It both suspends and anchors. It is present and it is timeless. These paintings represent the evidence of their own autonomy. They are metaphoric in an open way, not to interpretation as image, but as underlying principles and facets of nature. It's funny, I got an email from a woman, her father is Bill Anzalone, who was my teacher, my first painting teacher in the University of Houston, who's gonna be 85 years old, and she's asked if I'd call her dad for his birthday, which I did, and we started to FaceTime. We hadn't talked to each other in about 40 years. He asked me, how did, what, did I, what did I expect, or how did I feel about the, or my expectations about this exhibition that I was gonna have? And my response to him was, well, the paintings are exactly the way I wanted to paint them. And I placed them exactly the way that I thought they should be placed. And that was about it. Some people might have thought, oh, it was terrible that the show closed after two days. Or you can imagine an artist saying, God, my show closed and nobody ever saw it. But I think people make things because they want to make the things and they want to see them this, their, themselves. Not to be so egocentric, just the fact that you want to see this thing, you make it so you could see it. And I really don't know who the audience is anymore. And, you know, when we were younger or whatever, you have these expectations about having a show, getting agreement from other people. But I think that we're living in a time where uh, who knows if somebody could walk up and see it in person. So in a sense, it's kind of like being a ghost already. I mean, if I do have a show at the Met, say, I'll probably have it when I'm dead. And that's okay. I think when you're younger, you have different expectations about meeting people or somehow the longer you keep doing whatever you're doing, I think you just... Chris Walken once said to me, if you can't surprise yourself, how do you expect to surprise anybody else? It's interesting because Mark Beasley was saying to me that the work is completed when somebody sees it. Uh, and I think that's probably true in a certain way when, when for, some, for someone else. But um, because you, I guess the viewer takes these inanimate objects and turns them into something that has DNA and, 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 and becomes molecular and goes inside of somebody's body and brain and um, whatever that process is where they, uh, through osmosis or whatever it is when you stand in front of a, the physical object. But we're living in a time now where that's very hard to do. And so we're having this 
what is this called, a Zoom call? Where we're having a conversation like this to sort of, um, what, do some kind of um, accommodate the dire situation, I guess, that we're in and, uh, and communicate in society somehow in the best possible tools that we have to do it. Uh, it's very different. I, it was very nice that I was able to actually reinstall these paintings and people could go see them, but uh, I didn't know. expect- It's a completely new show. Yes. You just did a whole new show with a couple of paintings from the first one. You know, I love to paint out in Montauk and, and the, I had this material. I was very happy to make these paintings and, and also to show a couple of pictures that I didn't put in the last show. Uh, so, and like see it's, how- It's been a very, sorry, Julian, it's been a really prolific time for you. You've been working, you've been making so much work in the last few months. I like, I like being out here. It's good for me. I've been here since March 5th, March 9th. And, um, you know, it's the thing about being a painter or a writer. I mean, you can work by yourself. So, um, actually, or with somebody that you love, <laughs> you can, I mean, I've been working with Louise Kugelberg, my wife, we wrote a couple of scripts. I had started working on, I don't know, 17 years ago, eight years ago, but we sort of worked on those for a while. And then, uh, I'm kind of like a crop rotator. I'll do one kind of thing for a bit and then make some other kind of paintings and it seems to work. Where's that painting that you made? Um, there was a painting that you made, you came out here to visit me um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Where is that painting? In my studio? Yeah, you have it somewhere? I do, it's right. Well, one of your assistants or somebody bring it out where we could look at it? I think I could walk over there with the camera. If All right. I do it right. Anyway, he made a beautiful painting that I really. Uh, That's true. Like. We, we we talked about it, and when it was on. Oh, here we go. Studio Nares. <laughs> Perfect, just go closer. So Jamie has devised a way of painting where she has made these brushes and could, she could suspend herself over uh, these canvases and the brush marks are absolutely eloquent. And I love the way that that particular one sits in front of that space. I was thinking I can't about- do that anymore. I can't, I'm, not, I'm not able to hang from from wires, it was something I did and I had a couple of beautiful methods, um, but I do still make the brushes. Here's one in the process of being made and there's a whole wall full of my brushes and various. So that, yeah, it's amazing that you can do that. Uh, I mean, the thing is that we've known each other, it's what, since 1974, is it? Or 70 yeah, 74. Five, seventy-six, something like that. I mean, after forty years, you know, what does it matter? A year here or there. <laughs> but I, I was I think I was probably I think I was one of the first people to buy a work of art from Jamie. You were the first uh, person. You so, came to my studio, you saw these drawings and you said, How much are they? And I was clueless. I'd never sold anything. I went, Well, uh, uh, fifty dollars. <laughs> and you said, Yeah, I'll take six of them. So I don't know if you feel like, um, you know, what we really feel like talking about. I think that I'd like the audience, or if there are people in the audience that had wanted to see the paintings again in the show, or maybe before we do that, I could walk everybody around here for a minute. That sounds good. I'll show you where we are, where I am. This is my studio out in Montauk. I'm inside at the moment. I'm not seeing what I'm showing you, but I'm going to aim. That's a painting I made of my wife Louise this summer uh, as Santa Lucia. It's a oil painting, but it has resin on top of it. And I painted it by candlelight. She was standing there with the candelabra on her head with the candle in front of her. So you're seeing the reflection of some surfboards in the roof. 
there's a bunch of surfboards on the roof from different friends of mine over the years. So this is the Lion Girl Surf Clubhouse. There's a picture of me surfing at Pupakea in Hawaii right there. I made a reference, Julian, to your surfing in the text um, because it seemed that it's important to you in many ways. There's the sheer pleasure of surfing. There's the, you know, the aesthetic pleasure of carving a line through the water. And um, for you, it was, you know, you were a young kid from Brooklyn who was suddenly displaced, learning to surf, discovering a bunch of uh, guys who you could surf with was really an important thing in your life. Absolutely, I'm still friends with those guys. <laughs> I went surfing this morning, in fact, with friends of mine that I've known. We've been surfing for 30 years together. A little sunny. I paint out here. It's the most beautiful studio, Julian. These are some new paintings that I painted uh, over the past few weeks, where I was using a, a Japanese brush and shellac ink on, with this material. So, and then I took a hose and I was adding and subtracting with the hose. Do you have any of the Van Gogh paintings there, Julian? No, they're in the studio in New York. But we can actually probably figure out a way to, to stream them onto this program. They're astonishing to me because they morph bet between looking like Vincent and then looking like Willem and then looking like you. There's an element of, of self-portrait somehow. Seems to appear yeah, it's a funny thing, the notion of making self-portraits of others. Yeah, the idea of painting, first of all, I was making this film uh, with Willem Dafoe about Vincent van Gogh and I needed to make uh, the paintings in the movie look like the actor. So I was making paintings of Willem as Vincent for the scenes in the movie. And then Vincent used to make portraits of him, paint paintings of his paintings. So I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do that too. So I started to make paintings of the props for the uh, movie. I made plate paintings of them. And, and then they seemed to, uh, I wanted to paint paintings of people that were dead but actually paint them from life. So for example, my son Cy was posing as Velasquez and Oscar Isaac was posing as Caravaggio. So then I figured, okay, well, I painted those people as Caravaggio or Velasquez, then I better paint Caravaggio as Caravaggio. It's great to see them in the studio where they, they surround you. They become like friends in a movie. Okay, that's the first painting I painted of Willem as Vincent. And this is actually Vincent as Vincent. The thing is that Vincent did not have a beard in the painting of, uh, with his bandaged ear, but Willem did. So that's why it has, uh, Willem has a beard and Vincent doesn't. But it was nice to paint the same green coat over and over. I, I was just thinking how when you're surrounded by all the, uh, the Van Gogh paintings in one room, they become circular and like frames from a film. They morph from one to the next. Right. Um, appealing. This is a painting I painted of the painting from the Musée d'Orsay. Uh, now it's interesting, we should look, there's three of them, of Vincent as Vincent. It would be interesting to compare them because they're so radically different from painting to painting. They move in, the, in other ways too, of course, because of the painting on the fragments of, of, of pottery, uh, as, you, as you move around the painting, they flicker with movement and their expression changes. Yeah, and uh, look at this one. He looks so different than he looked in the other ones. Can you make it bigger, Porfirio? There's a vase going right through the guy's nose, which is sort of sticks out about four inches. It's nice to paint things when you don't have any idea of what you're looking at. And then there's other times you're looking at something that's so specific that you're trying to capture that. But in the process, you lose your mind. And in fact, there's a moment where it's, reality has nothing to do with, uh, with, with, with realism. I have a question from the audience. Okay, what's the question? Question is from Tracy Vitola, 
who asks, for either of us to answer, has your work become more personal over time? Or has it turned more to political or social issues? Um, no, I don't think it's become more personal. I mean, uh, I've always thought the more personal your work is, the better it is. Uh, maybe as you get older, you become, maybe you know yourself better and it could be more personal because maybe you are more of a person. But I don't necessarily believe that. But I don't think there's a difference between things being personal, social, or political. I think all those aspects are something that's part of your DNA or the way you do something. But there is a difference between work that is made for discursive kind of communication where you're sending a message, and that's not necessarily something that has to do with what painting is really about. It's sort of using it, painting in a way to send a message. And I think painting can be about painting and just by the nature of what it is, be political and social and personal. Well, I, as I get older, I, in a sense, become truer to myself. Um, I think any artist, you, as you go through life, you strip away the things that are less important to you. And uh, what you're left with is your truer self. And, and that has to be more personal in a way. Um, and I've also always thought that uh, there's a note in my old notebook that says, the release of intuition is my political agenda. All you got to do is show them what you did. And that's it. And it is political just by the nature. It's also, it's critical by the nature of its own existence. As soon as you put it in the world, it compares itself to everything else. And in a sense, without you saying anything, it's a judgment. Somebody could think you're right, you're wrong, they can believe you or not, whatever, but it's definitely a statement. And I, I don't think statements necessarily need to be curtailed or designed for generic um, popular consumption. I mean, in fact, I would say I'm not particularly interested in that. I have another question, Julian, from Max King, the surfer. Yeah, this is for you. Is there a connection between the sun-bleached fabric and your experience with the identity of Mexico? Absolutely. I mean, I live down in Mexico on the Pacific Coast, and I surfed there since I was 16. So uh, I've traveled all over there, and obviously pieces of cloth that are covering uh, these fruit markets in the jungle, they get a specific color when they're bleached by the sun that you can't get any other way. And, you know, usually they're things that people just discard. I mean, I think the people that own the, the, the fruit markets were extremely happy for me to buy them a new cover uh, to cover that would last longer and cover their vegetables and were very happy for me to take the other thing and do something with it. Uh, but as far as the color goes, it's an extraordinary color. And, and one of the reasons, if we go back, let's go back, Porfirio, can we go back to the show for a second? Um, just for a moment, let's go up to these two paintings, exactly. Uh, so turn up a little, Porfirio. You see the point at the top? That's the original color of the material. And I didn't want to build the stretcher to be rectangular because I wanted uh, this, the, the, these sort of radiating marks to be part of the painting. I'm always thinking about different ways that marks can be made, different ways of drawing. There's a question from somebody about the paintings from Anne Sanderson, who's saying she's going to visit the gallery today. And can you tell me about the process of making the works? I'll see there. And do you complete them over time or in one session? Well, if you're going to use gesso, it dries at a different kind of speed than oil paint does. I do paint outside and I leave the paintings outside. I don't take them in when it rains. So I'm using materials that um, for example, if I did work with gesso and it was going to rain, the gesso could be completely washed off of the material. So, well, once it's dried, it's plastic uh, gesso. Uh, and the oil paint is definitely not uh, water-based. So it, I, the paintings can really live outside. And if these materials have been covering, you know, when Nietzsche said, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. This material has been bleached by the sun before I ever got my hands on it. 
there's a palpable feeling of wind in that room. Yes, the wind. If you lean towards a divine light, it might not hit you, but it might. You know, people talk about thinking a lot before they're painting or after they're painting, but not necessarily while they're painting. And so it's, there's a sense of abandon that has to do ultimately with freedom. I'm very happy just to be able to work and not be in a cage. <laughs>